It's great to be on the show. Thank you, Hugh. The, the last time you came to studio, as I recall, you were in Southern California with your grandchildren visiting Disneyland, and you were very kind to come, but they must be in university now. That was 12 years ago. <laughs> yes, uh, some of them have even graduated already, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and I actually, uh, Barbara and I spent uh, Christmas in uh, L.A. With the, with the grandchildren. First time we've been able to see them uh, for, to, for two years because, of course, we couldn't travel in the lockdown. That is remarkable. I did the same thing. My my mine were in England. Well, yours were in America. Mine were in Oxford. Well, yours were in L.A. So it was that problem. My wife gave me my first question, uh, Ken Follett, because we fought over never like we fought over fall of giants. And your books do introduce dissension into close knit families because people want them first and never is riveting. But she asked me to ask you. Is there an unlimited supply of stories in your head? Because you go from genre to genre, from different storyline to different storyline. They're always wildly successful and well-written. Is there another one already teed up in there? Oh, oh yes, indeed. Well, I, I finished Never about a year ago, and I don't stop, you know, because I, I don't want to stop. Uh, sometimes I tell myself I really should take, you know, two weeks off between books and and uh, so I try, and then after about 10 days, I find I'm thinking of something that might be a really good story, and I just go back to work. Um, so I, for about a year, I've been working on a new story, and um, I'm going to apologize and say I can't tell you what it's about because nobody knows yet. And actually, I don't like to talk about a book too early because it might change. Well, and that indeed, makes sense. I might even... I might even throw it away, you know, those, there was, I do work on, sometimes work on books for a while and, um, and decide they're not good enough. And I did once work on a story for a whole year and throw it away. Uh, breaks your heart. Oh. <laughs> throw away a year's work. But you know, if it's not good enough, it's not good enough. And that's how it is. So um, I hesitate to talk until I'm, I'm really sure that this is the story that's going to be published. Well, I understand that. I respect that. I want to know there's a I have a bet with the former National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, who loved Never. I'll tell you about that in a second. But I don't want to tell you who's on which. Is there going to be a sequel to Never sometime down the road? Well, I, I, I've never I haven't thought about a sequel. Uh, uh, but um, a number of people have asked me that and it seems to have the ending seems to have raised some questions in people's minds. And um, I suppose I might one of these. I don't have one planned. It's definitely not in the plan. But um, uh, never say never, right? Well, never say never. I mean, I didn't expect Column of Fire to come out years after uh, Pillars of the Earth. Column of Fire, by the way, is now a mandatory read in my free exercise con law class because you capture the religious strife that led to our free exercise um, focus in the United States. But let's stay focused on never. Um, it, it is about the Chinese Communist Party. It's about many things, about Sudan and Chad. It's about the war against Islamists. It's about, though, the Chinese Communist Party. I think you are the first major novelist to tackle this terrain. Was it a difficult choice to make? Well, it's, it's, it is, it's difficult to find out a lot of things about China. It's a secretive country. Uh, and so the research was harder, but there are, there are some some very smart people who study China, and in particular China's uh, secret service and China's very hidden politics. And some of those, I was lucky enough to persuade some of those to be consultants on the book. Um, there's, a, there's a limited amount of information on the internet. You know, the, you know, as I'm sure you know, Hugh, the center of the Chinese government is, is, uh, is called um, Zhongnanhai, and it's a compound in the middle of Beijing. Uh, and for a brief period in the Mao era, it was open to the public, so people could walk around and, and uh, uh, take pictures. So we know a bit about the interior of that compound, what, what, what the buildings are. You can see pictures of the buildings and who occupies what building and what they're used for. So a certain amount of information is available. Um, and this, if, if you, I found by talking to these academics that I could find out what the probable truth was about many things. Certainty might be a little bit beyond. So it was difficult, but, um, but in the end, I think I got enough information to, to make a credible story. 
The the description of the Forbidden City's uh, government center and its lakes is riveting and detailed, and I have had confirmed by people who have been there. Uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, Robert O'Brien are friends of mine. Ambassador O'Brien, in fact, thinks you must have had someone walk you around the West Wing because you've got the layout of the West Wing and you've got the way that the National Security Advisor works with the president down. Did any of the former NSA sit down and talk to you? Uh, no, I, I wasn't that lucky. Um, uh, I would have very much liked to. But yes, I have been walked around the West Wing. I've been to the White House uh, several times. Uh, I've been. I w went as a tourist when you could go as a tourist, but I've also been for meetings with people there. So it's not completely unfamiliar to me. Uh, and um, uh, for example, one of my consult one of my consultants uh, was the uh, European High Commissioner for Foreign Affairs and Security, Catherine Ashton. Her name is, and um, she has spent a lot of time in the White House um, when she was. Um, she was the, the European equivalent to the European, the foreign secretary for Europe, like secretary of state for the European community when England, Britain was in the European community. And so she's very familiar. And, and several times she said to me, that, no, that wouldn't happen in that room. It happened in this other room. Or I had a whole scene set at Camp David, and she said to me, none of this would take place at Camp David. This, the president would definitely not be at Camp David at this point in the story. That kind of thing. So uh, so I had some authentic insider detail. Well, Ambassador O'Brien, who spent two years 30 yards from, or 30 feet from the Oval, and then often was in the residence, tells me, and I have never been in the residence. I, I spent two years in the White House as an assistant counsel, uh, to the president back in the Reagan years, and it's changed a lot. But Ambassador O'Brien just left, and you've got the residents down. So it's that kind of detail. Another detail that I found amazing, Ken Follett, and it, it's just a little one, but it's very telling. I did not know there was a Cadillac Center in Beijing. And so I went and looked up the Beijing Ducks and the Zhejiang Flying Tigers. There is a scene where a CIA uh, station chief meets with a counterpart at the Cadillac Center. I had no idea. How do you find out things like that? Did you go to Beijing? Um, I, I have been to Beijing, yes. Um, but that kind of thing, um, uh, you know, if, if you're patient enough, you can find out that kind of thing. I think I found that out on the internet. I don't know, I don't remember exactly how. But yes, I have been to Beijing a couple of times. times I've been to, to Shanghai uh, and I've been to Hong Kong several times. So. So China's not completely unfamiliar to me. I, I, there was a lot of research, of course. There were a lot of things that I didn't know. But uh, I mean, I put. But also, I just I put that detail in about the stadium where they play basketball, just because it struck me as so funny. It is funny, it, <laughs> it, but it's also one of those, when you look it up, it gets enormous credibility for the book. And I want the audience to understand what I think thrillers do for the general public is educate them about geopolitics in a way that no nonfiction book can. It's why I love Le Carre. It's why I love Daniel Silva. It's why I love this book. And by the way, did you know James Clavell? Uh, never met him, no. Okay, well, well I think of you in, in that kind of genre now. How about Le Carre? Was he a friend of yours? No, uh, once again, I didn't meet John Le Carre, although I think I've read all his books. Well, that's it. I, I think you're doing for China in Never, for uh, the West in Never, about China, what Le Carre did about the Soviet and center for a generation of cold warriors. Let me ask you about whether or not the book is, in, is for sale in the People's Republic of China. No, <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, and, you know, my books are very popular in China. They're translated into Mandarin. Uh, and we've, we've, sold, we've, we've sold millions of copies. Um, and um, my Chinese publishers come every year to the London Book Fair, um, two very sort of two very charming, very intelligent young women, and we chat uh, about um, how they're getting on with my books and and so on. Uh, and they said to me uh, after a long wait, I sent them never, sent them the typescript of never, and after a long wait, they said to me. Um, we're te they were terribly apologetic. They said, we're awfully sorry, but we don't think this book can be published smoothly in China. Now, smoothly, smoothly is a funny word to use, isn't it? Yes. Um, 
but um, I think I know what they meant. And I don't think, you know, everybody, everybody, every enterprise, every business in China is constantly checking with the Chinese Communist Party and saying, is this okay for us to do? And I'm sure that was what happened. And the, the party would have said, you know, I, I think you'll agree, Hugh, that I've, I've been fairly even handed in the way both the Chinese government and the American government and other governments are treated. I, this is not an anti-China book. I don't think um, it is um, not. It is extremely and, fair and realistic. It is, in fact, so fair and realistic that it's frightening because I think it's kind of like a war game that could actually go this way. And uh, that thinking about the unthinkable last question before the break, Sir Ken Follett, author of Never. Did you had you ever written about the unthinkable before? No, no, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I haven't. Um, uh, I've, of course, I, I was born in 1949, Hugh. So that was 1949, if I remember rightly, was the year the Soviets exploded their first nuclear device. And so I've lived all my life with the threat of nuclear war. So I've thought about it a lot uh, and being interested in, in world affairs and politics and so on. Uh, I've read a lot about this kind of thing. And so it's sort of... This is a sort of something that's sort of been on my mind all my life. And um, but this is the first time that I've actually written about it. And I'm very pleased. And in one way, I'm very pleased and flattered that so many people have read the book and said and said, oh, my goodness, this is realistic. This could really happen, which is which is very nice for me, but not so good for the world. A hundred percent. Now, my uh, my research found the Washington Post reviewer calling never urgent and fiercely compelling. The New York Times followed explain, explores how a conflict between Chad and Sudan draws the United States and China to the brink of conflict. There are many others, but there's nobody like Robert O'Brien, a national security advisor of less than a year's uh, uh, retirement, saying, wow. Hewitt, Ken Follett is on the air with me. His brand new book, Never, is a best-selling thriller across the world, and you will thank me if you get it and read it. You won't be able to put it down. Never has now been passed from me to the fetching Miss Hewitt. It, I wouldn't give it to anyone else because it's my annotated copy, and I was hoping Ken Follett would join me, so now I can pass it on. Uh, Ken, before I go back to the Chinese Communist Party in the extended interview after we go off the air in a couple of seconds, I want to talk about the secondary story on migrants, uh, the woman who leaves from Chad and makes her way. Uh, in January, the United States Navy in Morocco rescued 103 migrants off the Moroccan coast. I think differently about those stories now that I've read Never. Did you intend that? Did you intend to change the framing of migration stories internationally? Because I think you have for anyone who reads Never. Well, I guess, you know, Hugh, I don't, I, I don't, um, I don't write books with messages and... Um, uh, you know, my readers, because my readers, I'm not smarter than my readers. My readers are smart people. People who read books are pretty smart in the first place. And they don't want me to wag a finger at them and tell them what to think. Um, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do that. But I guess what, ha what happens when you read this book is that you, one of the characters is somebody who tries to make this, who does in fact make this journey from Africa to Europe. Um, and I guess because you see her life and her feelings and the difficulties that confront her, I, I guess you, you then see the problem of migration from Africa to Europe and I guess from South America to the United States and Central America to the United States. You see that problem in a different light. And really, I really think that's one of the things that novels do for us. They they, the, the writer's imagination, people like me get inside the heads of somebody like Kia, who is the character you're talking about in Never, get inside their head. And once you read that, you see, you, you don't see that person as just an alien trying to get into my country. You see that person as somebody confronted with an almost insuperable problem who takes the only way out that she can see. So I guess that's what's, that's what's happening. It isn't really an intention of mine. As, as you, you know, I'm involved in politics and I have strong opinions, but, but my readers don't want me to preach to them. No, you uh, you're you know, a storyteller. And in telling yeah, the story, exactly. it just makes people aware of aspects of yeah. their story. It's not unlike the old Quaker saying that an enemy is a friend whose story I haven't heard. 
So a migrant is a dramatic story that we just don't have any idea of. And what you've done is brought that to light. You also brought to light the operation of a CIA station in a remote country with which I have some knowledge because of, of connections and how political they are and how they work with the DGSE and the people who are on the front lines, both operationally and back at headquarters, who touch all that. I, I mean, it's all right. It's all correct. Good, good. Thank you. I'm very glad. As that's what I strive. I strive to be accurate because, of course, the, the, what people enjoy in the story is the suspense, the suspense. They get involved in the destinies of these characters. But the more realistic it is, the more involved you get. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I didn't want to write something like a James Bond movie where James Bond does all these impossible things. I wanted to write a story where you feel that this is this could be real and this could this could actually happen. No su no superheroes in Never and also no kind of supervillains. This isn't it's not a story about Dr. Death trying to destroy the world and James Bond coming along and saving the world. This is this is the this is the kind of thing that everyday life is made of. It is about the complexity of the world and the professionals who do their best to manage that complexity, sometimes without success. There is, however, on page 622, Mr. Kai, who's the central figure in the domestic and international spying apparatus of China, has a father who is a member of the, the Central Military Commission. He's an old liner. And the father says, quote, communism is a sacred mission. It comes above everything else, including our family ties and our own personal safety. You know, many in the West used to believe that. Uh, Sir Ken Follett, but not many people know that now. Uh, did you find that people sort of blink at you and wonder whether or not you're you're making this up? Uh, well, I, I the people I talked to about China all emphasized very strongly to me the the tremendous power of the Chinese Communist Party and. Um, you know, they, those people, they won the revolution and they're never going to give up. They're never going to willingly give up anything that they won in that. They're sort of obsessive about that. And I, I think you're right. I don't think it's generally known uh, that, um, that being a communist is not like being a Democrat or a Republican or a member of the, the British Labour Party. Uh, it, it is, it's not something that you do because you believe in it. It's something that you do because your whole life is, is involved in it. And you prepare, you're, you're supposed to be prepared to give your life for the cause. And that's what many of those people are willing to do. When we come back, we're going to talk about the CCP. There is a, just a brilliant rendering of how the CCP operates, as best I understand from people who've been dealing with it forever since former President Nixon opened the door to China 50 years ago this year. We have a good understanding, but we haven't had a novelist do it this well. Well, I don't think ever. Ken Follett's new book is never. He's going to come. The interview with Hugh Hewitt continues with Sir Ken Follett, the author most recently of Never. Among his other books, I Have Needle, Key to Rebecca, Pillars of the Earth, World Without End, the whole Century Trilogy, the Column of... They're all great, but Never is the first time He's gone into, the, I thought so, and I confirmed it with him ever, into the uh, thinking about the unthinkable, which used to be rather common. You also had to learn about North Korea. In fact, at one point, Ken Follett, you have the president of China, President Chen, say, well, there are 18 military bases in North Korea. Twelve of them are missile bases and two of them are nuclear missile bases. Correct. And I thought, I just learned more about North Korea military bases than I have ever known. Was, what's that based on? That's an amazing detail. Um, well, I... I, um, I got some numbers on the internet, and then I checked them with um, with my advisors. And in fact, the numbers on the internet were were, were close but not correct. And I, I I adjusted them. My advisors said told me what what in their opinion was the exact number. So um, uh, yeah, I went to some trouble to make sure that that was the right number. Well, it's very well done. Now you have a little bit difference from my understanding. I, I know that President Chen is in the position similar to that occupied by President Xi now. Foreign Minister Wu Bai, probably the same. There is a seven-member standing committee, which is sort of like uh, the, the central committee that you've got organized here. But you're very right on on their National Security Commission. It's just like the Americans have the FBI and the CIA. They have an inward-facing security apparatus. 
They have an outward facing security apparatus. Tell me the inspiration for Mr. Kai, who is the central character in the Chinese. Do- That's why I think there's got to be a sequel. We've got to figure out what happens to Kai. <laughs> well, Chiang Kai, um, I've, I, as I, we, we've, we talk about, I, the, the, I've portrayed the Chinese government as actually having two, two groups who are rivals for power. There are the old communists who are very traditional and determined to hang on to everything that they've won, all the power that they've won. And then there are, there are younger, more progressive people who feel that China should change. And for a little while, the younger progressive people uh, were winning, and that's when China became uh, more business-oriented and, and a, an enormous amount of poverty was just wiped out over that, over that period of time as China became more and more prosperous. Uh, but then the the old communists struck back. So there's this battle going on between the two of them, and I wanted my hero here to be on the side of the young progressives. But then I thought it would be realistic for him to be the son of somebody who was one of the old communists, so that the 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 the, the, the political struggle was also a personal struggle between a man and his father. I. I because I think, um, you know, I don't know about you, Hugh, I think most of us had uh, some arguments with our fathers yeah. when we were young and disagreed about, about politics and religion and all the important things in the universe. And um, uh, so it, it seemed to me that if the argument was really part of the relationship between father and son rather than part of a political situation, I, I felt that readers would get into it more. And they do. I, I, th- I think it works as a device very, very well. I don't want to, you know, I'm always against spoilers. I'm not going to take it any further than people need to read this for that. I also like Mickey Two Brains, uh, uh, Michael Hare, CIA analyst, who you describe at one point as a street person in jogging pants and wore running shoes with a pea coat in the Oval on a Sunday. Uh, I sat down with w, uh, George W. Bush in the Oval one time with a half dozen other journalists, and he explained to us Sundays in the Oval are never fun. Did anyone say if there's a Sunday meeting in the Oval Office, things are not going well? Oh, <laughs> okay. I did not know that saying. <laughs> yeah. It's just not, you don't want to have it. You also write about the 50 million Chinese who are living abroad, and you are very clear eyed. They are controlled by the regime, sometimes delicately, sometimes directly. Any pushback on that, Ken Follett? Well, uh, no, um, nobody's come back to me and said you're being unfair. Um, uh, this seems to be, and we've seen, uh, and we've seen how ruthless they are about this. You know, the Australian government uh, a while ago got kind of antsy about the activities of the Chinese Secret Service in Australian universities, and the Australian government clamped down on it. And the, the Chinese reaction was absolutely furious. I don't know if you remember, but they yes. banned imports from Australia. They, they, they struck a very hard blow at the Australian economy. You know, iron ore, which is a big thing Australia produces, sells to China. They stopped importing Australian iron ore. And I was, I, I was thinking, you know, what would, um, what would the Chinese do if the Australian Secret Service was operating clandestinely in universities in China. They would go berserk. They would absolutely go ballistic, wouldn't they, if they found that happening? And yet they seem to feel they have the right to do the same thing in other people's countries. I thought that was kind of amazing. But, um, uh, and it's, it's very sad, you know, because um, if, if this doesn't stop, then, then the rest of us are going to start getting suspicious of Chinese people. And that would be absolutely awful. I have Chinese people in my family, actually. I have three half-Chinese nephews who are wonderful kids, uh, um, all at university here in the UK. And they're, um, uh, uh, they're the children of my wife's brother and his very nice wife. And um, I don't want people to start looking at them as if they might have something to do with the, the darn... Chinese Secret Service. So I really think we, we, we've got to do something to stop this happening. Uh, uh, Sir Ken, you're right. Whenever Secretary Pompeo or Ambassador O'Brien or Senator Cotton comes on, they're always careful to delineate 
Chinese Americans from Chinese nationals because the national security apparatus of China operates on its nationals far more directly and with force than it does upon or attempts to do on second generation Chinese Americans of whom many are the greatest patriots in the world. So they were always careful to make the point you just made. But I am glad you have brought people some reality check here. Now, I want to close with the happy part that I want other readers to know about, not the happy part, the, the third plot. We've got the China-American uh, conflict. We've got the Korean conflict. We've got the, the Sudan uh, emigre. We've got the CIA operator and the CIA station chief. We've got the French wonderful man. We've got the subplot there. We have an American president, a woman. And part of your book describes the fact that American presidents are people, too. And, and she's got a Trump-like adversary out there, and she's, got, she's a Republican. And, but she's got a family. And there isn't been a presidential family that hasn't been impacted by the White House. And I'm glad you did that. Some of them are strength and others are not. What, what gave you your role model here, if anyone? Um, well, there isn't really a role model because um, uh, I started off, you know, it, it, her role in the story is to do everything she can to prevent a war. And that's what she, that's what she keeps on doing. Um, and I thought... Um, people know my politics. My wife was a member of parliament, uh, and um, so people know that I'm left of centre. And if if I had if I had had a heroic democratic president, I was afraid that people will say, "Oh well, Follett's doing propaganda," which is the last thing in the world I want. So I thought this this president can't be a democrat. So I made her a moderate Republican, and um, and as you stated she has a problem because there's a much uh, less moderate republican who's opposing her in the primaries in the in the re-election campaign so um but i made her a woman partly because i wanted to emphasize in this story that that all of the senior national leaders are trying to prevent the war that was what happened in 1914, before the outbreak of the First World War, and, and as you know, the First World War outbreak was the, was the inspiration for the story in Never. Uh, and what struck me, what strikes me about it is nobody wants this war, but they get it anyway. They make a series of decisions, each of which takes us closer to war, but they must be reasonable decisions. And so, so the most important thing about President Pauline Green is that she had to be a very reasonable, moderate person who wanted peace and was prepared to do just about anything she could to keep the peace. Uh, and, and despite that, despite her efforts, the story takes us closer and closer to World War III. So, so and I just think, I don't know if you would agree with me on this, but for most of us, we feel that a man is more likely to start a fight and a woman is slightly more likely to try and make peace. It's not a universal rule. You know, Margaret Thatcher went to war when she was Prime Minister of the UK. It's not a universal rule, but it's just a general tendency. It's more, it's more convincing to see a woman desperate to keep the peace. I felt, anyway. So well, this is, is I, I don't know if you know Susan Collins, but this is uh, Susan Collins' as president, and I think it's very well done. I do know Golda Meir, you never really wanted to cross her. So it isn't a rule that uh, Margaret Thatcher and Golda Meir are sort of my heroes out there in terms of uh, fighting back. But, but let me close on a, on a bigger question. You're, you've got 160 million books in print. You may be the most successful uh, novelist in the world. Are you worried about reading? Because I have novelists on all the time, and they are very successful. But is there even a chance for another Ken novel, uh, Follett to come along and do what you have been doing for as many years as you've been doing, selling as many million books? Because I think what's happened to, to fiction is what's happening to recording. It's sort of like the, the Beatles and their Peter Jackson. Have you seen Peter Jackson's Get Back series yet on the Beatles, Ken Follett? Yes, 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 yes. Right. So they were able to do that because it was a unique time and place and it was a beautiful work of art that Peter Jackson... There is no band that can do that now. Do you think reading is dying is my longer question. No, I don't. You know, and um, uh, 20, uh, 25 years ago, uh, when Tony Blair was elected prime minister... I ran uh, a, a campaign um, that was a sort of government um, enterprise between the government and the, and the, the book world um, called the National Year of Reading. And I was chair of that. 
and uh, I felt we did some good, um, but but we we did nowhere near as much good as J.K. Rowling did by <sighs> writing books that kids loved. That's the real thing. That's the real thing. P- kids, and you know, my my grandchildren were very small at that point, uh, but they weren't, you know, not very small. They were they were sort of uh, ten and twelve, I think. On Saturday morning, they didn't normally get up till about midday in those days, but they got up. They were they were in the in line outside the bookshop at seven o'clock on Saturday morning to get the next Harry Potter book as soon as it came out. Now that's the kind of enthusiasm that you want. The, our task is, we, I think, reading is is uh, reading is just going to be always going to be popular, provided we keep giving books that people are desperate to read, that they love, and books that when they finish it, they put it down. The first thing they want to do is call their best friend and say, I just read this great book. You've got to get it. That's, That's what, what I'm doing people. right now about never. By the way, just so you know that they last. My son, who is uh, 31, brought over the key to Rebecca the other day and asked me if I'd read it, which I laughed. And I said, open the book. And it's signed by you. He stole it from me. It's signed by you. And he's, he's just raving about the key to Rebecca. But he's got my copy of a Ken Follett signed uh, key to Rebecca. So your books last never is really a triumph. And I do appreciate the time, Sir Ken Follett, because you're in England, you got stuff to do, but I'm glad that you're willing to make the effort to get more people to read books that will bring them into conversation with people about thinking about the unthinkable. It's the only way to prevent it. So I appreciate your time. Congratulations on another international bestseller. Well, thank you. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you as always, Hugh. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for coming back. Be well.